Congratulations. Finally, I am pleased to introduce Deborah Wells Rowe from Vanderbilt University, an outgoing member of the Board of Directors, who will introduce this afternoon's speaker. Debbie. Thank you, Gay. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Anna Stetsinko to the Literacy Research Association as our plenary speaker for this afternoon. Dr. Stetsinko is a professor at the City University of New York, where she holds a joint appointment um, in the departments of psychology and urban education. She brings an international perspective to her work from previous posts at Moscow State University and the Russian Academy of Education, Max Planck Institute of Human Development and Education in Berlin, University of Bern in Switzerland, and the Center for Cultural Studies in Vienna. Dr. Stetsinko is internationally recognized for contributions to sociocultural and cultural historical theories. Her research is situated at the intersection of human development, education, and social theory, and her work uh, focuses on topics of subjectivity, collective agency, and identity, all viewed through the lens of social change and activism. Her work is widely published in major journals, and she's the author of several books, including one titled The Birth of Consciousness and a co-edited volume titled, Vyg titled Vygotsky's Psychology, Voices from the Past and Present. Her newest book, The Transformative Mind, Expanding Vygotsky's Perspective on Development and Education, is one you definitely will want to check out. It was published in 2016 by Cambridge University Press. In this volume, she explores how Vygotsky addressed the crisis of inequality through his conceptualization of the transformative activist stance. We look forward to her talk, and we welcome her to LRA. Thank you very much for a wonderful introduction. Thank you for inviting me here, Deborah and the Ivy and others. Uh, thank you for coming. Of course, it's a great privilege and a great joy for me to be here. So thank you for being here at this time uh, of the day. Why is it a great joy? Because I think uh, uh, really this conference is special. You probably know it yourself, but I wanted to mention that I think this conference stands for one of the most cutting edge area of research overall. I think the books I've just seen here outside of this room, I wanted to read each and every one of them. I really mean it, I'm not exaggerating. The titles are amazing. I think this, this, um, this area of research is at the uh, front line, at the front line of uh, uh, fighting for research which is meaningful, which is about meaning making, uh, imagination, interpretation, human dimensions that stand against the brainism and um, research that reduces everything to just the brain or big data with uh, p-values which actually do not work. Uh, if you're surprised to hear that, look up, look up uh, the latest um, issue of the journal Nature, Nature. Uh, so just look it up, uh, for uh, it really came out just a few days ago, so uh, November 28th. What do we do with statistics? Because statistics is unreliable, un, um, uh, invalid very often, and um, that's one of the topics that I want to, uh, to discuss today, is that the type of research you are doing, and uh, I see myself as belonging to the same uh, type of research, to the same camp, I would say, um, that uh, we don't need any excuses in terms of our, is this science, is this objective science, is this validity, objectivity, um, reliability. Yes, that's what real science is and that's how it looks like. Just like the books outside, uh, they stand for the cutting edge research and for cutting edge science. I would even say that's a metaphor that I like. Uh, this is uh, literacy research is a rocket science. So it's a much more rocket science than anything else. Because what can be more challenging and more difficult and more, of course, inspiring also than teaching literacy, re doing research on teaching literacy, raising uh, minds to life. It was a wonderful title of also a wonderful book, Rousing Minds to Life. 
uh, by Ronald Tharp and Colin Moore. Chris probably knows that book. Anyway, so, uh, so this is just as a, as a in way of a p uh, brief introduction about myself. As you just two words, as you heard, yes, I've done research in many different parts of the world and also in uh, interdisciplinary fields at the uh, at the intersection of education, um, human development, to some extent biology, which I have to say also have uh, been engaged in, and philosophy. So it's an interdisciplinary area, which I hope you will see how it comes across and how it comes together to, uh, in terms of making some points to support literacy as a rocket science. So I will be talking about infinite potential and about it disrupting, disrupting inequality in education and beyond. I've added to this title, which you saw in the program, just two more words, or a few more words, I said through pedagogy of daring, because these are very important key words for my line of research and for my recent works, including in the book that has been mentioned. So pedagogy of daring, uh, which is based on uh, mm, assumptions uh, that uh, mm, we are in the midst of a crisis, in the midst of uh, huge contestation where stakes are very high and uh, our stances matter and uh, our daring matters. Okay, so I will get there uh, through weaving several themes and getting to the topic of infinite pot potential. Mm, I can say uh, in way of uh, illustration and maybe uh, to introduce if a, a humorous, a little bit humorous element, I can say that um, the, when I was uh, interviewed on the topic of infinite potential by a journalist, and she, she, she was saying, oh, this is a wonderful notion, infinite potential, so all children have infinite, and students have infinite potential, sounds very good. Have you measured it? <laughs> and I said, <laughs> Okay, I'm glad you're smiling and even laughing. Well, the whole, whole point is that it cannot be measured exactly because it's infinite. And the, no <laughs> and the notion on, of infinity entails that this is not something that can be measured. We'll get there, hopefully, through the uh, slides as I go through them. I want to start by a quote, and I will be using a lot of quotes, and otherwise I will be a little bit improvising with these quotes, because I believe in, in improvisation, as some of you know, but I will be weaving different voices and dialoguing with them in a polyphony, where it's Bartinian term, from different people. One voice right here is from Florida. So this is a quote from actually New York Times. Uh, you will see why. The fight is not over. The state seems pretty, pretty adamant in moving forward as quickly as possible, even in the face of incomplete, inadequate, possibly corrupted, invalid, and unreliable data to, in order to protect a system that is mortally wounded. This is by someone who is a Miami-Dade County Schools superintendent giving interview in New York Times, so it's a short time ago, but I liked this uh, putting together, together of these terms about, and of course it's about assessment and introducing new assessment in schools and uh, working with new approaches that uh, have uh, high stakes uh, testing and so on. So I really liked the expression that um, the state is moving forward within a system that is mortally wounded and with data that um, Incomplete, inadequate, possibly corrupted, invalid, and unreliable. Please remember those terms. I will be using them throughout. <laughs> they apply to many things today, actually. It doesn't apply only to the area of testing. Uh, it really a lot of uh, so-called golden standard research, p-values, which I've worked with, I'm not saying it from outside, I'm using my inside-outsider perspective. They are like that. They are incomplete, inadequate, possibly corrupted, pretty much so, invalid and unreliable. So as we uh, speak about that, so you, you see I'm bringing up this uh, dichotomy of golden standard research and research that many of you, I assume, are doing as represented in, in uh, the books outside and the literacy research, typically meaning-making, interpretation, um, discourse analysis, 
and uh, many, many other um, modes of analysis, but beyond only statistical uh, reliability and things like that. So this dichotomy is very important to face and face head on. So um, because this brings us also to the question of what does science do? And here, it's, it's extremely important to raise these big questions that many people might think, well, we are over the, those big questions. We're not over them. We need to raise the question, what is science? Every day as we enter schools and as we do our research as well, and what is science is a big question, one of them that needs to be not glossed over, but looked at very carefully. Look, this is another very recent quote. Traditional science is devoted to understanding what is the case rather than what ought to be. What is the case? What might be accomplished if we place ought in the forefront? How can we actively build the kind of society in which we wish to live? And don't we gain valuable knowledge in our efforts to bring about change? This is from Gergen, maybe some of you know, Kenneth Gergen, Josselson, Freeman, 2015, American psychologist, very central journal for psychologists. This is an interesting way to bring across the uh, dilemma of doing research about how things are versus doing research about how to change things. So most traditionally people would say that science is about how things are. How? What is the case, right? What is the case rather than what ought to be? Nice way. I'm glad they are now in the American Psychologist 2015 raising this. I am a little bit skeptical that they placed here question marks everywhere. I would take those question marks out and I would say we need to accomplish a lot if we consider not only what is but also what we want to see should be the case. And we should value, gain valuable knowledge uh, also through our efforts to bring about change without question mark. Okay, so this is therefore, I'm moving closer to what I really want to communicate about today. This is about theorizing activism. Placing the questions of what we want to see happen in the world and how we want to see the world to be. This ought, it's a very old fashioned word, but I'm using it in a non-traditional way. So how do we see things need to be? How do we desire and wish and imagine them being otherwise, other than what exists today? So my work is about, and I know I work with others also, and I'm drawing on a lot of people also in perspectives to attract attention to the need to theorize activism. So the need for theories that explicitly support and enact activist agendas for social equality and justice without any fear of ideology and bias because uh, the case can be made uh, for the point that uh, doing research with an activist agenda is the way to do science. And that's what I'm trying to do in, in, the, in the way of theorizing activism. So activist agendas, uh, make research as real and objective as it gets, and actually more than real. So research without activist agendas at the forefront, within the body of research, in the rationalization, in the rationale, theory, conceptual approaches, methodological steps, design, uh, data collection, data interpretation, conclusions, all steps of research need to have activist agenda integrated in them, right there, connected throughout all the threads and steps of research. And I think it can be done without fear of incrimination, without fear of being um, accused of ideology and bias, because the, the way to see the world through the prism of what we desire to exist in the world, that's what makes research objective not some neutral ideal of science as we have been taught through many years and students until today are taught that objective science is when we take out the subjective elements out of it and try to view uh, the world from nowhere. That's an old fashioned science that produces results that are inadequate, invalid, incomplete, <laughs> corrupted, unreliable, and mortally wounded in the research uh, type. 
uh, I'll, I'll, as I said, I'll bring up these words again and again. So, uh, so to write the what or what we desire as a, and imagine needs to be created and transformed in the world, world, specifically of social justice and equality into theory and methodology, it's not enough to just say that we are activists and just to say that we are committed to an agenda of social justice. It's also very important to revise the whole system of philosophy and theory that supports research models and what is science going down, maybe up to the very foundational notions of what is reality, how do we know the world, to the ontology and epistemology of our worldview. And from there to build a new, uh, new I think, or at least a revised, um, a revised uh, framework for uh, science that is truly objective, but not in the old fashioned neutral way. Uh, and I'll, I'll move uh, uh, forward to, to explicate and to show how uh, these points that I'm presenting now can be supported and carried out through. Uh, I do want to say that when I say here objective and modern real, I go back to a lot of, it's a very old philosophical tradition, very, uh, I'll return to that, but I like to use the term subjective for this objectivity. Not objective and not subjective, but S slash objective, subjective. Research that takes to the fullest who we are and how we want to transform things that we see around us. Because what we see around us is actually more an illusion than what the future is. What you see right this minute in front of you dissipates and disappears very quickly, just as, the, as our reflection in the mirror is already outdated by milliseconds, okay, but it's already outdated. And everything that uh, seems to be sturdy and real actually melts in the air much more quickly than what we imagine needs to be and ought to be through the activist stance and subjectivity. Okay. So, all right. I think one of the biggest obstacles is that uh, we're still still inundated with notions that people are born with fixed differential potentials. We're told every day in every textbook of psychology, human development, and education, unfortunately, more and more, will tell you that children are born with fixed differential potentials. But um, this is the other challenge, is the, uh, that the so-called objective value neutral science, which is disinterested and uh, supposedly provides answers, cannot address this first challenge of uh, moving beyond this notion that children are born with some kind of fixed differential potentials. But we shouldn't cede too much territory in terms of um, our notions of reality, objectivity, evidence, validity, progress, human nature, and truth. We shouldn't cede this territory to this objective science. This objective science, so-called objective science, produces only data that are inaccurate, invalid, incomplete, and corrupted, so we can do better than that. Okay, so just a few quotes, because I think it's very important. I hate to, to wait, spend time on critique, but I think it's very important to see what's going on around us. I think it's just a few quotes will illustrate. While claiming value neutrality, the dominant perspectives, especially on intelligence and achievement testing, carry with them an old legendary of the magic, science, and religion all mixed together. Magic, science, and religion producing data that are inadequate, invalid, incomplete, and corrupted. Science textbooks act as purveyors of outdated myths about science. This is uh, Stephen Gould. Every day that I open a textbook on psychology or human development, I see uh, outdated myths and outright lies about how children are, uh, have fixed potential and uh, in, inborn traits and so on. Okay, from f several authors, including Jill Moravsky, whose works I like very much, misunderstanding has re reached epidemic proportions, epidemic proportions due to the determined efforts to impose the so-called gold standard methodology and quantification mandate. And I am tempted to add, which produces inadequate, invalid, incomplete, and corrupt data. Well, it, it's absolutely true, as scientists themselves actually acknowledge. And that's, I mean, that's 
doesn't mean that um, nothing else can be done, but there is always a way to improve. And nonetheless, the status quo is like that. So uh, science, uh, unfortunately, is still perceived as dogma uh, versus what I think is very important, uh, uh, the principle that every explanation can be peeled back to show it is insufficient, requires further discussion ad infinitum. Every explanation is corrupted and invalid and insufficient. Every explanation, not a single one, not in a single textbook, not on neuroscience, not on genetics, uh, although we are, we are hypnotized to think that these are the answers. Uh, they're not of that sort. A wonderful quote, perhaps you will find it useful, by Jacob Ronofsky. Knowledge is personal and responsible, an unending adventure at the edge of uncertainty. Every explanation can be peeled back. Every uh, fact and um, finding needs to be seen as inadequate, invalid, incomplete, and corrupted. It needs to be. That's the right way, actually. It's not only a, a, an accusation of bad quality. It's just the way that science works. Science works to produce data that are in, inadequate, in, invalid, and incomplete. That's the normal, uh, normal way, science, uh, way that science works. And that's just something that we are often led to believe is not the case. So the, the resurgence of extremist biological determinism laden with mythic gender and other types of assumptions, I would add, of course, racist assumptions, that's what has resulted in the, from the um, mantras of uh, p-values, uh, brain, brainism, and uh, genetics. Genetics and neuroscience have fueled fueled racialized science despite evidence that racial groups are not genetically discrete, reliably measured, or scientifically meaningful. This is from Smedley and Smedley. And ev but there is evidence that the media and, mm, is tr are truly biased towards uh, positive representation and even uh, exaggeration of re research findings in pharmacology for uh, treatment with, um, for example, ADHD and so on, but also of results in in uh, genetics and brain research. So, what, just briefly, we can move on to see right here in this slide. It is really time to ask ourselves, is new eugenics a food? Unfortunately, it is. Claims about the genetic and neuronal basis for achievement, mental disorder, risk taking, and so on, they are everywhere, in every newspaper you can open. And every program, every day on media there will be something, even on NPR, unfortunately, even on the, on the progressive, so, so supposedly progressive radio, uh, you will hear about gen genetic and neuronal basis. Much of the evidence for such claims is as controversial today as in the past. I, well, and that's very carefully put. This is by Alan, Garland Allen. I mean, a more, more, I think, more direct way would be to say much of this of the evidence or evidence for such claims is inadequate, invalid, incomplete, corrupted, unreliable, and uh, unsupported. How close is this to eugenics? Unfortunately, we're well on the road. And this is in parallel to the 1920s, uh, the same background of deep economic crisis, bitter anti-immigration sentiment, and social upheaval. The parallels are stunning. And the developments, unfortunately, in uh, much of research in psychology and at the intersection with education is unfortunately of that kind. So we have neuromythologies, uh, misunderstanding, misreading, and even deliberate warping of scientifically established facts. This is from several authors I take and I play with, uh, with voices from uh, by many people. Well, common neuromythologies include sweeping statements such as about 10% of brain usage, left and right brain thinking, and female versus male brains. None of this is even close to anything that could be regarded as true or even plausible. Absolutely, it is outright mythologies. Okay, and uh, actually, just to share, that's uh, just uh, from uh, the authors who work in epigenetics on the other side of research that actually um, uh, rejects those uh, types of eugenics and so on. And I want to share this because I don't know how, whether it's already broadly uh, known and represented, but this fr from recent developments in biology and epigenetics. To describe a behavior pattern as innate, 
or genetically determined. Any behavior pattern is, in fact, a statement of ignorance about how that trait actually develops. Attempts to identify traits that are innate versus acquired are both meaningless and invalid, and also corrupted and unreliable. Okay? A belief in innate traits reflects a commitment to preformationism and ultimately mysticism. 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 There is no way anything is innate or inborn. It just isn't, and that is well known already. But that is kept as a secret almost. At least it's not, uh, it, it is, this is not channeled into the textbooks, unfortunately, and into um, how we teach psychology, human development, and ultimately also education, and areas that are connected to those. So in the traditional approaches, that was the metaphor, core metaphor. Yes, the single person, isolated individual, alone, thinking to himself, uh, withdrawn from the world, no context, no concerns there. Okay, today that's what we have left. Even that, per that naked person is gone. See, he was naked there, right there. So not even anything in terms of dress and being clothes and so on. That's what is left. It's, uh, it's very scary, actually. We have a conceptual revolution in the meantime, in the sense of a relational worldview. The rela I've heard that yesterday the talk was also related to the relational worldview by Judith Lysaker, right? So I assume many of you were there. And um, I want to mention this development very quickly and move then to transformative from there. But relational worldview is a very important step to then move uh, to the transformative worldview that I think could be even a strengthened version of a relational worldview. So in the relational worldview, very quickly, sorry to go through these terms kind of uh, um, uh, without pausing for each of the terms, but they deserve that, but uh, certainly you're very welcome to um, to get a, a, a copy of this PowerPoint. And please contact me if you, if you would like to discuss anything that I'm presenting today and going through a little bit too quickly. I'd be happy to then uh, answer questions either today or later on. So that's why the talks are always for me as uh, stepping stones to then a discussion that can follow. So anyway, the, in the conceptual revolution that is taking place, we're dealing today with relational worldview, and we're talking about co-evolution of persons and the world, the continuous dialogue and participation, the relatedness and interconnectedness, the coming together of individuals and the world that transcends their separation. That's the key in the relational worldview. There is a coming together that transcends the separation. The relationship between the person and the world is what is, uh, is, what is primary and needs to be looked at rather than the separate entities, would be the person or the world as such. There is a relationship which is primary and it transcends. And of course, it all comes down to how we understand the term transcends. That's a whole diff uh, long conversation. I assume some of it took place yesterday. So that's why I feel okay to move quickly through those steps. Okay, the individuals are constituted through relationships. Relationships are not added to the person, but Persons are constituted through relationships within particular contexts and their interactive dynamics at both macro and uh, micro levels and social levels and so on. This is known by today. Actually, this is an achievement and uh, this is a, um, an accomplishment of the 20th century. The, I would say actually much of 20th century was devoted to finding out that this is the case that the relational worldview, actually in biology and physics and many sciences, and in psychology too, by some of the scholars I'll just mention, and in education as well. 20th century was really about that. That's my, at least, assessment. Assessment, yes, not in the, in the testing kind of way. But yes, development is a self-organizing, probabilistic process in which pattern and order emerge and change as a result of complex interactions and relations among developmentally relevant resources, both internal and external to the organism. Yes, again, 20th century. That's a very important. I mean, it is still very important. It's not to diminish the importance of this uh, frame and this theory and this approach, not to diminish. It's just to say that it, it had roots 
much earlier. So it's grown through the decades. It's still at the f cutting edge and the, at the front of um, many approaches that need to be concerned more about this kind of notions and this kind of theory. Yes, there is no person alone, but the full situation of organism environment interaction. And we, it's not enough to ask what's, what's inside the child. We need to ask what the child is inside of. Yes, relational worldview. From that, so many important implications, entailments, uh, absolutely of radical nature, including for literacy research. The mind-boggling combinatorial complexity of the bidirectional traffic inherent in the process of development, which blurs the boundary between genes and environment. Completely blurs, not just says, oh, it's both. So if you hear it's both genes and environment, say no, okay? Say no to that, because it's much more than that. I'm just inviting you, I'm not, it's not, of course it's up to you what you will say, but I would say no to that. It's not about both genes and environment. That's the worst thing we can say, because it produces an aura of, solu of a solution, which is not a solution, because it's, my, it's about much deeper things, because there are no distinctions between genes and environment, really, in a, true, much, in a very deep sense. So we're talking about dynamic fusion of biology and ecology, and this is the key to understanding both development and evolution. I'm talking about works by Bateson, Ingalls, Oyama, very important by works by Susan Oyama, biologist, and so on, but, and many other names, uh, not all of them here. So, emerging alternatives today, not actually just today, but again, starting in the 20th century. Development as a process that is relational, transactional, transaction even stronger, distributed, socioculturally situated, dynamic, contextualized, dialogical, co-constructed, enacted, and embodied. These are terms that come together with the notion of relational worldview, and each term stands for a whole theory or, or, or approach that would deserve to be discussed on its own terms, but they all speak in unison. Sometimes they don't see each other. We had a discussion with someone earlier today about how really approaches that speak basically to the same points, they pass, they walk past each other, because, but they really truly speak to the same relational worldview kind of um, theory and position. And of course, nature and nurture is one process, nature culture, composed of collective social practices that are contextually embedded, culturally mediated, accomplished, interactively accomplished, and continue extending through history. These are big words, and we can walk past them also very quickly and say, okay, it's not nature plus culture, it's nature culture, one process. It's not just saying that. The, the implications, the devil really is truly in the details and the implications. For each and every step in our thinking about children, about development, about teaching and learning, and literacy. Okay, so, so this is about that nothing exists in advance of development. Development is a key term, development. Nothing exists before development takes its course. Its course. Development is easy to overlook because you cannot touch development. Where is it? How would you? It's not tangible. It's not, it's not something you can even imagine almost. It's in the air, but it's more real than many other things. So the course of development as, as one among those relational processes is what is at stake and nothing happens before the course of development takes shape and before development takes its course. Okay. So I'm talking here about this, these are known things to, throughout 20th century, all of that, those they're known within so-called second psychology, developmental second psychology. They were very well, were, were very well known to Dewey, to Vygotsky, to Piaget, to Kurt Lewin, Wartowski, later, okay, we're moving to the 20th, later 20th century, Wartowski, Thielen, Schotter, Bronfenbrenner. I mean, sometimes Bronfenbrenner is taken completely separately from what Vygotsky has been writing about, for example. And actually, we could add Bartin right there. But they were speaking to many of very much the same points. It's very important to see them as speaking in unison, because then we can also see that we stand on 
Yeah, I don't like the expression standing on the shoulders of giants, but we have a lot of a background on which to stand. So approaches such as activity theory, actor network theory, dynamic system theory, developmental systems theory, and these are theories of distributed and situated cognition. Okay, a little bit to repeat, uh, theories of enacted and embodied cognition. Ecofeminism, feminist material in developmental epigenetics, they speak to those uh, also notions, and they are, they are coming more into the unison, to speak more in one voice, in this conceptual revolution. Many people have described it. Okay, but there is a next challenge, because we are now in the 21st century. Okay, because the relational worldview is wonderful for the world that is in its status quo and doesn't need to be changed. And if we are content with the world as it is, then we can go with the relational flow and the relational worldview, pretty much as Dewey was content with the status quo. Well, it's a contested topic, but it uh, um, doesn't matter. Uh, but uh, definitely for the theories that see themselves as uh, being about the world as it is, the relational worldview is fully sufficient. For the world in crisis, as we are now, I think, we need to move past the relational worldview, not to discard with it, take it fully on, but also strengthen and expand the relational and turn it in the sense of transcending it, turn it into a transformative, we can say transformative relational, but truly transformative is stronger than relational. And this is based on the notion that people are not just situated in the world, not just dwelling, dwelling in it, as in many ecological perspectives, in reactive mode. This is a, a very common assumption that goes with relational worldview, together with the relational worldview, that we are dwelling in the world, we are situated, situated. Well, if we are situated, then it implies the notion of the status quo. We are situated within something then that exists. How about if we are not situated, but we are continuously challenged and are challenging what exists and continuously moving beyond what exists? It's more than being situated. It's more than contextualized knowledge or situated perspectives. Because there is nothing to be situated within. It's too unstable. It's too much in crisis. What you see today is in such a, such a uh, situation of flux, but it's a modern flux, situation of instability, crisis, turmoil, precipice. I don't know if you feel this way. I certainly think you might. <laughs> Yes, it's uh, this conference. Yes, that's what I meant in the beginning. Yes. So if we're more than situated, then perhaps we need to talk more about agency and um, talk about persons as actors of their own development, agents for whom not only things matter, but who themselves matter in history, culture, and society, and who develop as unique individuals exactly through and to the extent that they matter by making a contribution to collaborative practices. I don't know if I will have enough time to, to go into each and every notion built into what I've been just saying now, but the, the, the core, the key here is the notion that we can reinstate the agency of including agency of, of persons, individual persons, if we also see persons as actors of social practices who are not only situated, not only participating, but also contributing to how these practices are changing in often very contested ways, painful ways, sometimes invisible ways, because we see changes very often after the fact. We look back and say, oh, by the way, everything changed, and we are in the midst of change, we don't see it. Often, not always. I can give you examples, but okay. Um, probably there isn't time, enough time. But uh, very often, if we are, mm, we are still thinking about it's either the social agency or the individual agency. 
we really, it's, there are ways to get past this dichotomy much more, much more radically. If we, uh, especially if we take read of the notion of the world as existing, as is, because it is not is. There, there is nothing there, there for us. That's, by the way, a quote from Patty Luther. But, so a totally different author, but all of a sudden her voice is so apropos here. There, is, there has never been, oh, she, I think she was using Deleuze also. So there, was not, there, there isn't even there, there for us. So there isn't a status quo because it's changing. So it's, it's, it's in such turmoil and instability. Okay, so I'm using for this uh, shift from relational to transformative worldview, I'm using a lot of process philosophy, including new materialism also, works of Whitehead, even James Dewey, Merleau Ponty, Hannah Arendt, I put her in here, although it, it's, we could argue whether she belongs here, but anyway, Isabel Stengers, very important work, work in uh, science studies, Barad, um, Karen Barad, Latour, and so on. Ecological approaches by Bateson, by Gibson, by the way, there were two Gibsons, James and Eleanor. Eleanor is often forgotten. Her works are no less important than of James Gibson. Uh, Critical pedagogy, sociocultural study, Fraser, pedagogies of hope and desire, Leif, Holland, many others, uh, Wenger too. Dialogical frames, Bakhtin, ex extremely important here. So this is a melange of approaches that I'm using, and of course, Marxist philosophy, but uh, in the extensions that were accomplished by Gramsci, Lukacs, Sartre, Fromm, Ilyenkov, Lefebvre, and Jameson, and many more French authors of today. So this is done in order to move from the relational worldview, which is fit for the world that is in the state of the end of history. Remember, just only 20 years ago, in the 1980s, end of history, everything is achieved. Everything is uh, at the pinnacle of all the desired things. No way, no way, no need for big changes and transformations anymore. Well, for the world in turmoil and crisis, okay. Development is then not then only not only relational, but it's really a constant work in progress by people who together simultaneously co-create the world and themselves. A co-constitutive collaborative achievement of an activist nature. Uh, that it would take a lot to unpack this, but I think the key here is this notion of co-creating ourselves as we are participating participating and contributing to the changes that propel the world forward, non-stopping and non-stop to the next, transcending to the next process state, which is also unstable. So a unified process of people transforming their circumstances of life, and again, simultaneously in this very process, being transformed by their own, own transformative practices and agency. In this very process, being transformed by their own transformative practices and agency. This is beyond Marx, for sure. I mean, Marx is very central here, but uh, he was invisible, yes, because, but he did say that we need, it's, it's no point to interpret the world, we need to change it. He said it, he, some people say he dotted it on a napkin. I don't think it's possibly true. If you read his bi biography, someone would need to look into that, but that's, that's one, explanation, but anyway, he never really explained what it means in terms of then changing our philosophical outlook of what is ontology. How do then we understand the world and ourselves in it if we, are, if we take the position that we need to change in order to understand? Well, I'm trying to, to make some moves here by drawing on many, many other people. As I said, those you saw these names, not, these are not even all the names. If you look up my book, you will see, I think, 20 pages of uh, references. Yes, so um, a lot of voices from uh, previous century, from today as well. So, and uh, okay, but the, the key was that we are not shaped by the world, and we're not just shaping the world. Many people say that, but sometimes they come across as two separate processes, but it's being changed 
in the process of changing and being realized in the process of changing. It's a, it's a, it's a very mind-boggling kind of philosophical proposition, but it's a very exciting one, so I invite you to explore it. So it's about uh, uh, knowing being doing, our acts of transformation, about creating novelty and moving beyond the status quo. And then uh, I have many explanations what it means ontologically, but I will skip some of those because I know my time is a little tight. Ontologically, what the world then needs to be seen as. If we take the position that we cannot dwell and that we do not dwell in the status quo, and I think we cannot dwell. But, yes, it's up to uh, others to decide what works for them, of course, but that's one of the options. So the epistemologically then, what is also, it's all related then to change. And it's about also introducing the notion of change in a very central status. And uh, in this case, Theories become also much more than just theories. But now, back to the beginning where I started my talk about the infinity of potential. If we take the notion of transformative worldview and ontology and epistemology, then what becomes central to doing research and actually to all processes such as perception, perception, thinking, memory and so on, but for research, the approach then uh, is about taking a stand and commitment to such as matters of equality as the first analytical step that leads all other, including methodology and conceptual work. So then the, the, the ought, the old fashioned term of ought, what we want to see, if we want to see equality and social justice as part of what we are doing and what we see also, what we want to see happen in the world, then a stand on this proposition and on one or the other side of social justice struggle, which is a struggle, become part of the very process of research. So then theory becomes a process of enacting equality. Then rather than just taking stock of what exists, so it becomes really truly an action. Theory is a form of action. And this has been said, but I think a lot of those things that need to be tied together. So theory is a form of action that makes equality possible and true. Okay, back to the infinity again. So all people have unlimited potential and are profoundly equal precisely in this infinity of their potential that is not predefined and therefore incalculable and unidentifiable in terms of any preconceived, hardwired, inborn uh, endowments, abilities, or, uh, and so on. That this potential needs to be actualized by persons themselves as an achievement of togetherness, supported with access to authoring requisite cultural tools and spaces for their own agency within the collaborative dynamics of shared community practices. So it's not a solo process of an isolated individual, and yet it's also the work of the person, of realizing the potential. I'll skip some of more. So then, in this case, uh, we can see that development can really be tied much more centrally to the effort and to the work the work that children are doing, not alone, but through the process of development. Development, uh, this is a quote from Esther Thielen, development is the product of the child's everyday and continual effort to make things happen in the world, rather than a process that is predetermined and pre-programmed by any initial conditions set in place at the start of life. So it's a result of continual efforts to make things happen. And of course, society uh, is providing, and other people in the relational vein are providing supports and spaces for this to happen. Is it then that we're talking about individual agency? Certainly not, because there isn't an individual person. And it's not for nothing that long ago it has been said that there is no such a thing as a child. We shouldn't even worry if we are talking about an isolated child because there is no such a thing as a child. Oh, this was said by Winnicott, if, if you might know. 
And of course, the, the core here is to say there is no such a thing as a child. Of course, there is a child, but there is no such a thing as a child because there is always a relation, a relation of the child to others. So um, this is not a sole activity by isolated or, uh, individuals. Instead, the activity itself is embedded within large activity systems and critically relies on interactions with others, mediation by cultural tools, access to social resources. This has been written about, including by Chris Gutierrez, who is here, by Barbara Rogoff. This is from your paper with Barbara Rogoff. Yes, 2003. And uh, of course, so this is um, that it's not a part of the sociocultural research tradition that builds around Vygotsky and Bartin. Yes, but then this element of agency I feel needs to be built in much more centrally. So okay, then that's one quote from no, finally my book, <laughs> that uh, the the one that has been mentioned, the transformative mind. Mm, so I, can, I hope you can see it in the back, but I'll read it out. Development does not just happen to people. It's not something that happens to us. It's not. It is a collaborative and creative accomplishment a process that comes down to work and effort within and through collective social practices and their affordances and mediations, as well as obstacles and contradictions, and these are as these are created by people collaborating in together, agentively enacting these very practices. So we are not in the world, and development doesn't happen to us. How can it be we're not in the world? No, because we are in the process of the world creating us and us being created by our processes of creating the world. If you feel like there is a little bit of, be, of recursive element there, yes, I, I confess to that. But it's really what it comes down to, the recursive process, us being created by our own transformative efforts and work. Uh, so. All right, so scientific, wrapping up very soon, scientific discoveries and advances of recent years in research areas from biology and epigenetics to neuroscience and developmental psychology, basically they, they have all shown that there is no predefined uh, potential, there is no ceiling imposed on any one person or child, especially at the start of life. This has been all shown. This has been shown in the malleability of genetics, the practical, practically infinite plasticity of the brain, the vast potential of cultural mediation to propel development forward, and the enormous potency, that's, that's the term now being used, enormous potency previously unacknowledged of experience, environment, cultural mediation, and social interaction in development. And yet we read in the textbooks that children are wired. Why is that? Well, because we're back to the question of, uh, you know, what gets to be placed to the textbooks and who decides that the brainism and neuromythology and genetic essentialism is fed to the students, uh, such as, for example, in community colleges where I've been doing some work together with uh, Eduardo Viana and others. Mm. So it's not just about objective science and the, the facts uh, and evidence there that often is inadequate, invalid, incomplete, corrupted, and unreliable. It's also because, yes, I do need this quote, and I do need to read this out. It's also because recent decades have been wasted on hostile social policy and civil rights changes that have diminished and divided our society with many disruptive and destructive trends of racial and economic polarization, segregation, and economic disinvestment. These policy and changes are built on many unfounded and untrue assumptions and invalid, inadequate, incomplete, and corrupted. Okay, this is from Gary Orfield, 2014, educational researcher. This is what's happening, and in this context, the, the conceptual revolution and the, and the um, shifts that clearly should be moving us along uh, the lines of uh, seeing so, the possibility of social justice agenda and infinite potential, they have been clouded completely. So Gary Orfield continues, these, these assumptions include an outright mytho... Oh no, that's me now. Okay, this assumption... <laughs> 
These assumptions include an outright mythology akin to eugenics about biologically determined inborn talents and the predetermined biological limitations rigidly imposed on developmental outcomes. This mythology urgently needs to be uh, dispelled. But to do so, and that's my last slide, to do so, science involves taking a stand. Taking a stand is part of science and research and methodology. The critical constituent of being, knowing, doing is taking stands and staking claims on events, conflicts, and contradictions in view of the goals, commitments, and aspirations for the future. It's about the process of making up our minds as literally a process through which our knowledge and subjectivity and processes of teaching, learning, and research come about and are made up of. So making up our minds and um, uh, doing research that will too produce evidence that is to some extent inadequate, and evid invalid, and incomplete, but with full realization that we need to move then and to make the next move, a next step, and not dwell on what has been achieved and being able to uh, then critique. Okay, that's uh, just a, the um, cover of the book that um, was mentioned before. Um, and this is also a lot of these quotes. We are mentioning this because if you're interested in any of the quotes, many of them in a much more uh, verified way with the pagination and so on, they are in the paper that just came out in the Review of Research and Education on the topics of disrupting inequality edited by Maisha Wien, uh, who is here, and Mariana Soto Manning. And I have a chapter there about a radical notion of equality. So I recommend this full issue, right? The full issue on uh, the, um, uh, in the Journal Review of Research and Education. I also recommend uh, the book by my co my someone who I work often with, by Arievich, Beyond the Brain, which is also a very resolute resolute critique of brainism that is taking place and uh, essentialism that is part of this concerted, concerted policy of objectivist science, which is really not objective in any true sense of the world, of this inborn mythology, which is racist and uh, sexist, of us being born in, to be predetermined and pre-wired for only certain things rather than others. And, uh, and research that doesn't explicitly or hesitates to explicitly take a stand as part of the agenda, of the activist agenda. So uh, with this, yes, there is nothing else to say then. With this, I would end this talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.